So what, what we're talking about is for me, one of the more exciting reinvention stories I get to watch and it's still unfolding, which most reinvention stories have a nature about them that they unfold in chapters. Uh-huh. Versus, uh, make a leap over a bridge and say, I'm here and end of story. So, and it has not been the case for you. Uh, yeah. It's been a, it's, I've had a convoluted path. Like there was, there was no simple way to really do what I did. I I definitely, when I finally decided that this is what I wanted to do, I, I kind of was like, okay, I have to, I, I kind of halfway did it in the beginning, but it was like, no, I can't halfway do it. I ha- I have to make a leap. I have to have to finally just decide that I'm going to be a filmmaker and go do it like go do it yeah yeah jump in and be be the filmmaker so let's go back because I want to trace your steps yeah if we go back to when I first met you Uh this was before the USPS yep What, what were you doing at that point when I first met you when you and I first met what was I doing I was probably working before I started working at the postal service. I was working retail for Adidas outlet. Okay. That's right. And that's, that's, I mean, there's many things before that, that I did. Um, I worked just to keep it simple before I did retail. I worked in human services, like, not I wasn't a social worker per se yeah Uh, I did a lot of um what I would call behavior therapy and I worked with kids with developmental disabilities and kids with behavior problems and um there was an an event that occurred with one of my clients when I was working for a, a place here in Salt Lake that was a contained elementary school unit for kids with behavior problems and one of my favorite clients ended up having basically a, a mental breakdown. Mm. And um, I kind of sat there and had to watch him literally melt down to the point that we had to call uni and bring in basically an ambulance and take him away. Wow. And Yeah. Really, really intense. Um, and it was just in, in that, that moment of like, oh man, like I have no power over what's happening to him. And as you're watching it unfold, you feel power. Yeah. Yeah. And I just kind of just, I think I had hit my peak of just burnout. Just that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. And um, I was on a softball team at the time. And one of my, one of my teammates ran the Adidas retail outlet. And, you know, I just was like, I need something else to do. I can't, I can't mentally do this anymore. And you know, she was like, well, I'm looking for somebody and maybe this is just a a transition job for you for now, but at least it's, it gets you out of that situation. And um, so I went and I, sold shoes and managed the retail outlet for a couple of years. And, you know, I wasn't really happy there necessarily. I mean, I definitely, I spent my paycheck. That was the problem. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, you could spend your paycheck because you're interested in, in the gear. Absolutely. It it got you out of a situation where you were burned out and it gave, it gave you an out or a bridge as we might say. Yep. It totally, it was like a little, a, a nice parachute for a minute. You know what I mean? Like, um, it gave me that moment to like breathe and kind of take things into consideration of, okay, now, now what do I want to do? You know? Um, so while I was doing that job, um, my girlfriend basically said, you know, I, I found this opportunity, um, you 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 like being active you know it's a career path that it's good benefits it's good pay it's hard work but 
fun work and you'd be out out and about all day long and I was like what what are you talking about she's like I think think you should go test for for being a letter carrier they're looking for letter carriers right now they they was an ad in the newspaper back in the day when we had newspapers right (laughs) Um, we don't even have those anymore really um and so she convinced me to go take the test and I just you know I was like I'll just go take the test. And if I pass, I pass. If I don't, then I'll find something different to do. And, you know, working retail and getting older, I gained a lot of weight. And so I kind of looked at it as if this works and I can get into, um, you know, a a letter carrier route that has walking, then maybe I'll lose the weight. Maybe I'll get back, back into better shape, you know. And, um, so I got the job. It was, uh, I think, oh, I was almost, I was a, what they call a part-time flexible for almost a year before you get a permanent route. You basically are just, you're at their, you're, you're at their whim. Like they send you all over the Valley to different stations. And basically you're kind of like the cleanup crew of, of the, of the station. You take people's parts of their routes that they hate and they're usually horrible (laughs) and uh, (laughs) in horrible areas of the town and lots of mail you know and lots of lots of just like having to hustle and figure things out and because it's not your route and it's a piece of a route and then you're going from this piece to another piece it's like starting a new puzzle every day yeah exactly exactly and so there was a lot of great things about that well I'm hearing also that there's an inner dissatisfaction while there were some great things how long did that job last I stayed at the postal service for three years um I had uh Early on, while I was a part-time flexible, I got assigned to be the part-time flexible at Mill Creek Post Office. And that post office was called, they, people in the Valley called us the Billy Goats. Oh. Because we packed a lot of mail, um, you know, catalogs, just, you know, all kinds of mail just a a large volume of mail and it was all walking routes and it was up in the foothills of salt lake and so lots of hills and lots of lots of lots of mail lots of walking my when i finally got a route uh which was about a year a year and a couple of months in um to my time with the postal service i had uh been asked to be the union steward for the postal service uh, letter carriers union uh, for the Mill Creek post office because they didn't have one and nobody wanted to be one of those people. Like our office hated the union. Um, They hated the rules that the union had because they all liked to break the union rules Mm. because they benefited from it. Uh, You know, lots of overtime. So and, here, so here you are now, rising to management again uh-huh. in the union. But I can still tell the negative outweighs the positive. Oh, absolutely! It was, it was. Um, I was not. I wasn't liked by my manager at the post office. I wasn't necessary. I was liked by my coworkers, but you know, if I if I called out the management on some of the things that they were doing that were against the rules, then that affected how my coworkers were getting paid. They kind of would give me shit, you know, for doing that. And so it was really kind of like a thankless job. Right. Um, You can't win. Yeah. You can't win one or the other. And um, I finally got assigned a route. So I had my own route. It was a six mile walking route and um, had a ton of mail on it. And I took a shortcut one day and ended up blowing out my meniscus in my right leg. I remember that. And um, during, during, the, during the time before, before I hurt my knee, um, you know, there was a lot of things that happened on my route. Um, I had, I had in, in a two-day 
it, it was like a three day span. It was a Friday. I had a, I had a resident in my third. So this is my third year in, in, so I had been on this route a long time and lots of people knew me on my route. And, uh, I came around a corner in my truck and this was a part of the route where I could actually use the truck to deliver from and came around a corner and this gal was running at my truck from her house to the neighbor's house. And I was del- looking to collect mail from the neighbor's house. And, but I knew that they were on vacation. And so I always just check, you know, to make sure, cause I, I checked on my residents. Um, yeah. And so uh, she came running towards the vehicle and she was hysterical. And, and she basically said her dad had died. And she was running to the neighbors to for to try and get help from them. And so I had to make a decision. Am I going to go finish my route and just let her be? Or am I going to go and help? And I made the decision to go and help. Um, yeah, he was way, he had been dead for many hours. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I stayed on, I had called 911 for her and uh, so I was on with the the person and, you know, she was asking me, you know, what do you, do you know first aid? And I was like, yes, I know first aid. I went in, he was very, very much expired. And um, she wanted me to wait around until the paramedics got there. And so by the time I was able to get back to doing my mail, I was pretty shook up and I had yeah. called my boss and I had talked to her and told her what had happened. And uh, said, you know, I'm going to need help to finish my route on time. And that is when the hassle began. Like she just, she was really kind of rude. Um, and was like, well, you'll just have to finish your route. We don't have anybody to help. And I was like, well, I was like, well, then I'm not going to be on time. And she's like, no, you need to, you need to make up the time. And I was like, no, I'm not going to make up the time. Like I've been basically an hour plus you know, with this woman. So, so I, I, she finally did send somebody out. Um, I think she thought I was lying and, uh, you know, it was just repeated with her. She always, she always questioned what I was doing. Well, and then the next day, didn't you have another incident? Yeah. The next day she, I had a, cause we were wore uniforms and I had a pen that had exploded on one of my uniforms and I, I didn't have any other clean shirts. And so I wore the one that had an ink stain on the back of my shirt and I was getting my route ready and had my back to the, you know, the way that it works, you get your route ready in this, what they call a case. Yeah. And I was throwing all the mail and getting ready. And I feel this poke in my back for the pen. And, and she basically pokes me in the back and is like, what's this blood? And I think she was like really like trying to get my goat, you know, from what had happened the day before. Right. And just like really trying to get me to explode. And I said, no, it's ink. I turned around, you know, and I said, no, it's ink. And if you'd like me to go home, I'm happy to go home. I didn't want to come in today. If you want me to go home and change my shirt, I'd be happy to. If you want me to just go home, I'd be happy to. And she was like, Mm, you know, cause I basically put it back at her. She, she basically was like, uh, well, we don't have anybody to carry your route. So you just do your thing. And I, she's like, how much time is it going to take? And I say, it's going to take what it takes. I basically just was like, I'm not, I'm not giving you a time. I'm going to do my route, how I want to do my route. And hey, so tell us what happened the next day, <laughs> the next day, um, I, so that was on a Saturday. We don't deliver on Sunday. On Monday, it's weird that I even remember what day it was, but it, it was January or June, June 23rd. Um, this would have been 2003. Um, my parents' anniversary. That's the reason why I remember the date and right. the day. Um, I'm doing my route and it gets later into the afternoon and Uh, I hit a portion of my route where we do what we call hopping, where it's not mounted delivery where we're in our car and delivering the mail out to each mailbox, but we, the the houses are far enough apart 
that we have to drive and jump out, you know, put in park, jump out, go deliver the mail, jump back in. It was snowing and pretty hard. I mean, I would say, you know, it was, it was cold and snowy on June 23rd of all days. I know we and have once in a while. Drove, <laughs> only once in a while. Right. But it happened. And I was driving on uh, one side of the road and I go down and you turn to the, to come back and do the other side of the road. But as I'm passing this one house, I notice they look like it, it, there was smoke coming out. Um, it looked like maybe it was from their fireplace. I didn't really think anything of it because they're an older couple and I'm thinking, well, they're not going to turn on their heat because it's June. They probably just started a fire to warm up the house, you know? And so I went down and came back. And by the time I came back and I pulled up in front of their house, cause there was trees from the house before them. So you can't, it's obstructed until you get to it. And so I pulled up, put it in park and I grabbed their stuff and I turned to get out. And literally there was smoke coming from out all the eaves. And so now you knew this or something was up. Yeah, I knew that like, shit, their house is on fire. So once again, I called 911 <laughs> and, and basically, uh, you know, say, my name is Holly Tuckett. I'm a letter carrier. I'm at this particular address. My tenant, you know, my client's house is on fire. And I basically was, when I went up, I could see this, they have like a big window that's along their carport. And then uh, it, da down, there's a stairway that went down the stairs that you could see. But I also could see kind of down the hallway towards the back of their house on the main level. And so, but I could also see that the smoke literally, like when they tell you to get down and crawl in a fire, there's a reason they tell you that. Like there was literally yeah. black smoke all the way down to like, probably if you were looking down the hallway, you could see somebody's feet and ankles. And so I'm on the phone. I, as I'm walking back towards, you know, she was like, do you know if they're home? And I said, they're absolutely home. They only have one car. Their car is here. I know they're not on vacation, you know, because I deliver here all the time. They would have put in a vacation hold. And so uh, she said, well, can you, can you, can you see anybody? And I said, I, I was standing there. And just as I'm walking back up to the house again, uh, I see the husband coming up the stairs with a bucket of, of water <laughs> and he's running back down the hallway. And at that moment, I noticed that somebody had opened their door, but their screen door was shut and there were dogs there. And at this point, some, one of the other neighbors had come up and I noticed too, as I'm looking down the hallway I could see his wife's feet in slippers, right? So we know we and have two people in the house. So there's two people in the house. And the woman, you know, so I say to the woman on the phone, I'm like, you know, there's two people in the house. Uh, I, I said, I'm terrified to go in here. Like, literally, it was so smoky. You know, it's like this moment of like, shit, if I go in there and will I can't I come breathe, out? will yeah. I come out, you know? And so she's, she's like, um, you know, do you, do you, can you, can you see, is, is it close enough that you can get to her to bring her out? And I said, yes. And I, and she said, okay, I want you to cover your face and, you know, stay as low as you can go in and grab her and bring her back out. So I did that as I did that, our dogs got out and they ran and one of the other neighbors kind of rounded them up and put them in her garage. Um, but the woman was kind of disoriented and, um, the guy that was, that had come over to help me took her and kind of went, went off and sat down with her. And I said, the, the husband's still in here somewhere. And at that point, you know, she, she said, well, uh, you know, if you can see him, get him and bring him out. If you can't, don't go in because you should be hearing the sirens any minute. And 
I could hear the sirens finally. And uh, so I, I saw him and I actually grabbed him and brought wow. him, brought him back outside the door, but he was fighting me. Um, he, he wanted was, to fight the fire, he, didn't he? Yes, he wanted, he was, he was like, this is my home. I'm, I need to stop the fire. And I was like, but the fire engines are coming and I don't want you to get hurt. And he literally was like just arguing with me. And then he just, he broke my hands for Cause I was holding him <laughs> to like stop him from going back in. And he, he broke my arms free and he went back in. And I said to the woman on the phone, I'm like, he just went back inside. What do I do? And she's like, you know what? Just let him go. And the, the firemen will find him. It's, you know, it's, not enough time that he, he might pass out, but he's going to be fine. Wow. And I was like, okay. So, so once again, you know, now, now like the news stations are showing up and, you know, all that kind of stuff. And so once again, I got to call my boss and be like, Hey, uh, uh, there was a fire on my route and I had to stop and save these people. And the news stations are here and they want to interview me. And so I'm going to be needing help again and she literally at this point though when she was like oh the news stations are going to be there like you know because now it's like oh we're going to look good and I want to be a part of that and so she literally showed up up there and <laughs> you know was like how can I be helpful to you you know um, <laughs> and so, so how did you leave the the I mean this how is did I how did I leave this toxic environment yes how, um, what did you do next and I think well, I, I, I ended up getting hurt that's that's right you know, I ended up getting hurt I ended up having to have surgery um I think it was that same summer after I had after I had done done that rescue I ended up having to have surgery and you and were thinking knee. about you were thinking about becoming a, a physical trainer. a physical trainer yes I was I was I was getting certified as a through an organization called the NSCA the National Strength and Conditioning Association and I was working to become a strength and conditioning coach and getting certified and so I was like bummed out one because my knee now is blown out and two um I just I was like now I'm now can I really do that with having a bum knee and I was just very unsure of where where to go next and because I wasn't set up enough to make that jump I was working towards it but I wasn't ready yet right and um so that was when I came to you and right. I and I basically was like you know what am I I I, I want to move to this next thing but now with my knee and being unsure about where I'm at and just wanting to get out, like I wanted out of the postal service so badly um, because so it was we, just so toxic. Yeah. So we just made a, a switch and you got a great job um, bridge. It yes. was not your dream job, but it was a good bridge to go coach at Franklin Covey coaching. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it couldn't, it, I, I remember you got me, you know, she, you, you said, I, I, I think this would be a nice gap stop for you. You know, it may not be, it may not be like what you want to do, but, but, yeah. but you're already a coach. You know, yeah. you were, I was a trainer when I was working in human services. I did a lot of training um, and managing and in the postal service with all of my union stuff, I was a trainer basically. And so, you know, my, and my whole life I've been involved in sports and coaching and, you know, helping problem solve and stuff like that. So you kind of helped me flesh that out. And then basically kind of said to me, you know, would you consider being a coach? And I was like, never thought of it before, but okay, let's, let's see if I can interview and get the job. And I remember when you first called me and said, I got you an interview. And you said, unfortunately, they want, they, they want somebody to do sales. And I was like, literally, if you could have seen me Lynn on the other side of the phone, 
I literally was like, fuck. Right. Okay. <laughs> I'll interview for that. But in, but like my face was like, fuck, 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 fuck. Because I was like, there is no way. I am, I am like, I do, I do not like sales. I don't like to be sold to. And I do not like to sell. It's like either you want what I do or you don't. And I'm not going to try and convince you otherwise. Right. And so, so I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to just, I'm going to, I'm going to try because I need to get out of this situation. And so I remember I went and it was, it was probably not my best interview. And I remember them calling me back and saying, we'd like to offer you the job, but we want to do some training with you, you know, for sales and, um, you know, but, but we, we'd like to give you a shot at it. And I was like, okay, not really what I want to do. I said, I literally said to them, I said, this is not really what I want to do. What I want to do is coach. And so, but if this is what I need to do to get into the company and then maybe be considered later, then great. And luckily they needed a coach before I ended up having to start right. sales. Right. Like it was so lucky. Um, and so I ended up being a coach for the rich dad program for Robert Kiyosaki's program. How long did you do that, Holly? Let's see. So I left the postal service in November of 2003 and I was employed as a rich dad coach until 2006, like the, the summer, early fall of 2006. So almost three years. So what did you do after that? That's, that's <laughs> where I lost track because you came back in to reconnect. Um, after. Actually, yeah, after. So what did yeah, you do? After. So um, while I was working as a rich dad coach, um, you know, you, it's, it's a, it was a great job. It was a great job. And I was, I was pretty, I was a pretty good coach. Yeah. I was a pretty good coach. I had, I had one of the highest success rates, um, you know, as a coach in, in our program. And I told it like it was, I mean, you know, I, there was one of the things that I think kind of, I, I think I would have maybe stayed, but I just didn't, there was a few, few salespeople who sold me as being something that I wasn't. And I was very adamant uh, with my boss that I was not going to say that I was some millionaire, real estate guru, whatever. I'm a coach. And that's all I wanted to be. And um, there was a couple of salespeople who just to get sales would basically lie about what my qualifications were. And um, I remember there was one guy <laughs> who actually looked me up. He Googled me. This was like the early times of Google, right? And he Googled my name. And, and when we got on the first call, he said to me, he's like, you know, I Googled you and I couldn't, I couldn't really find anything about you. I did find a person who has your same name. That was a letter carrier who saved people from a fire. <laughs> and I said, that's me. You're talking to her. And he was like, but you're a real estate investor. And like, you do like you do this because you already made your millions and you know, whatever. And I was like, mm, no, no, I'm a coach. I, I quit that job and I'm doing this job. And, uh, I want to, I want to help you be successful in whatever it is that you want to do. And that's what I do as a coach. And he was like, I said, but if, you know, if you need me to be a millionaire for, for that to sit well with you, then maybe we should have you be transferred to another coach. And I'm totally fine with that. Like I'll get my boss. We'll talk and we'll figure it out. I said, but I am one of the better coaches here. So, you know, but I leave it totally up to you. You know, you were told by a salesperson that I was this person but I'm telling you that I'm this person and, you know, 
that might not sit well with you. And he was like, well, I appreciate your honesty. I'm going to stick with you. And he ended up doing really well. You know, he ended up, in, you know, buying some properties and, you yeah. know, fulfilling his dreams, you know, and doing that kind of thing. And, and that was, you know, many stories like that where, you know, I had clients who um, did very amazing things, you know, while I was coaching them. And I think there was just a point where I was like helping other people reach what they really wanted to do, but I still hadn't figured out really what what it was I wanted to but do. You knew, I mean, I can almost, I knew you're I helping knew. people with their dreams, but you knew you had a dream. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, there was, there was, I, I remember when I left the post office, there was a woman there who was the first letter carrier in the state of Utah that was a female. And her and I kind of forged a friendship because she was part of the union. And I always said, you, your story would make such a great documentary. And I, I said, and she's like, well, do you know anybody who, who does film? You know, and I was like, no, but I would love to tell your story. And at this time, the iMac had just come out and iMovie. Yeah. And um, I had started messing around with that and like doing stuff, family videos and, and montages, photo montages, just for fun as a release when I was working for the Postal Service. And um, somebody saw some of those that I had done and I had done a couple of family, like family history videos or something for somebody. And somebody said to me, you know, have you ever thought about doing film? And I was like, film school, you know, no, like, I don't, I don't, I'm 30 something. I don't want to go back to school. And, uh, I remember coming to you and saying, when I was at coaching, I was like, you know, what, how, how would I go about changing paths? And what do you think about me becoming a filmmaker? And I remember you, you introduced me to somebody that was actually a filmmaker and we had a conversation and I asked her, I said, you know, I, I'm 30, I think I was 36 at the time. And I said, I'm 36 years old. I really like, I don't want to go back to school. Like, I don't think I'm cut out for going back to school at this point. Uh, I have a hard enough time being managed. Like I can't imagine having to like literally go back to that like place of like that student teacher relationship, you know? Um, and she was like, you know what? She's like, just get a camera and start shooting stuff like do stuff and I said so no film school she was like she was like if you didn't know how to network if you didn't know how to connect with people then I would say go to school but she she basically was like you'll just be wasting time right you know so I we went on a vacation to Europe in 2005 um you know I had been working at at uh, the coaching program long enough that I could literally go to my boss and be like, okay, we're going to take a two and a half month vacation. Is that cool with you? And, um, you know, we, we basically phased out my clients, uh, you know, so that I could take that long of a break. And um, while I was on that, that vacation, you know, I shot tons of video, tons of photos, it was, it was just a time for me to like take stock and like really figure out, okay, is this what I want to do? And, uh, I had invested in some properties at the time. And so I kind of felt like when I came back, I, I started coaching again. Um, this would have been like probably around mid October of 2005. And so I started coaching again, but my intentions told my, my, my headspace had totally changed at, over those two and a half months of being away. I knew that I had to 
leave coaching. I knew that I had to at least try to, to do film. And yeah, yeah. you'd had enough experience that something alive in you was different than where you were at work. And so when you were shooting and filming, you were more alive. Yeah, way more alive, way, way happier, way. How did like, you make that transition? So I basically, when I, when I was, when I came back, I went to a four tens uh, schedule. Right. In, in that final probably six to seven months that I was working as, as a coach. So you kept and, your day job going while you started to play with the film. Yep. I started, I started um, building out my business plan and, um, you know, a lot of what I started out doing was um, just f family history videos and, and things like that on the weekends. Um, you know, doing, putting together photo montages for like birthdays, anniversaries, you know, that kind of thing, baptisms, you know, all sorts of stuff. Um, so I would do that on my Fridays through Saturday, Sunday. And um, towards the end, I started um, networking into student film stuff and um, talking, you know, finding finding the people that, that could get me tied into where the film stuff was happening. And so I ended up volunteering a lot on student film sets and basically anywhere where someone would let me on a set. I, you know, I just would, I would go and be like, I don't need to be paid. Um, I just want to learn. And so, you know, I'll, would, I'll clean toilets if that's what it takes, you know, or whatever. You created um, your own apprenticeship almost. I did. I did. I mean, I really did. Um, when I finally left in 2006, it, it going into the fall, um, I, I basically had enough money kind of put away and I had the rental properties and um, I was like, I'm just going to make a leap and do this like start so, looking for paid work. Okay. And so you were still freelancing somewhat, but yep. you could piecemeal yourself out. And so you were looking for that 1099 entrepreneurial. I only need this many gigs to make this much money. Yep. Yep. Completely. And how, how did that unfold? Because today you are <laughs> a filmmaker. This is I am a filmmaker. I am a filmmaker. Um, you know, it, it, um, I started with like nonprofits offering to do like videos for them. So I wasn't making a ton of money because they're nonprofits, but, um, I knew that they had a need and it was a way for me to build my, what they call real, which is speak. It's film speak for resume basically. Right, right. Um, so in building out my reel, I would, I would, try and find companies that would allow me to tell stories the way that I wanted to tell them. Um, it didn't always work out that way, but every now and then, you know, a, a company would let me kind of play and tell a unique story about their business. And that's, that's because I really like documentary. I've done a lot of uh, narrative film work uh, but most of that has been either as a, a producer type person, a unit, a unit production manager, and or, you know, just a utility person um, in lots of different positions. But well, I, I, rem I know I look at, at your uh, trail and I would see you up to Sundance at the Sundance festivals. Yeah. You doing all kinds of odd jobs to get on a film crew. Yep. Then you would be with your own team. Mm -hmm. So you basically beg, borrowed, and stole anything you can. Yeah. Right on the stealing, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> stealing and, knowledge, I guess, would be the... Yeah, that's what you, you know. That, that's that's kind of how I look at it. Give me some knowledge here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I had one guy who taught me a lot about lighting. And, uh, you know, I, I would... I would volunteer to help him on, on sets and stuff, especially when, 
he was working on student films where he wasn't getting paid a lot, um, but he would need hands, you know, he would need help. And once we would set up the, the lighting setup, then we would have what I like to call the Steve Verlin clinic. And because on a film set, there's tons of downtime, not necessarily for everybody, but certain departments have a lot of downtime and lighting and grip or what they call grip and electric, which does all the lighting and all the wiring of lighting and making sure that, you know, the power that goes to the lighting is not going to fail. Um, he would, he would basically, we would sit out by his trailer and he would teach me about what was in his trailer, what they were, what all the different parts and things and stands and this light does this and this light does this. And you, and know, you were interested in all of this, right? Oh yeah. I was totally interested in it. Which, which is a good indication you're into something yeah. that matches your skill set. So leap forward to today and tell our audience, Holly, what you've accomplished in the last 12 months with your filmmaking. Oh, wow. Well, this, so five years ago, we started a documentary uh, called, well, at the time it was called The Kitchen Case. And we were, we were, we began on December uh, 20th of 2013. And we started following the marriage equality case here in Utah. And there was me and three other filmmakers that uh, kind of picked up cameras and got got ourselves embedded with the plaintiffs and the lawyers from that case. And so we filmed for 2013 into 2014 uh, as the case was going through the court system and uh, basically all the way until the Supreme Court basically said, we're not going to hear Utah's case. Um, and uh, so we, we kind of were like, okay, what's our film? What's the ending? Uh, it took us a couple of years to kind of figure that out and to find the right funding, um, in order to finish it. But once we found that, uh, in the last 12 months, uh, we basically edited our film starting February of 2017. And we edited for almost a full year, entered it at Sundance, didn't get in, unfortunately. Dan Reynolds. <clears throat> <laughs> Two gay movies from Utah, same time, not going to happen. Um, so, and he has more money because he's Dan Reynolds and the Imagine Dragons and he had HBO. So we kind of missed out on Sundance, but uh, we did end up going to the American Documentary Film Festival where we took the special jury award for our documentary called Church and State. And um, we ended up um, also uh, going to the Nice International Film Festival in Nice, France, where we took best, best documentary. And uh, we also screened, I didn't go, but we screened in Kosovo uh, and in Mexico City, um, in they do like a kind of a, I don't know, it's like an exchange program with the American Documentary Festival, where they send their best films out to them to to uh, showcase. So we were chosen to go to Kosovo and chosen to go to Mexico City um, through the American Documentary Film Festival, uh, and. Yeah, we had a theatrical release uh, this summer in the end of July, and uh, we are on demand right now uh, in our distribution uh, platform. Which means uh, that you're on, are you on Amazon and Netflix? Amazon, uh, not Netflix, unfortunately. So we're on Amazon, uh, iTunes, basically if you have if you do, I've never done this myself, but uh, Xfinity on demand and um, DirecTV on demand. Uh, and then there's a couple of other uh, services. There's a service that is aff affiliated with the uh, library systems called Hoopla. Yeah. We're streaming on Hoopla. And um, I can't, there's a couple of other ones. Um, 
I should send you a link that just, it literally is like a catch all for all of our, um, all of our platforms that we're on and right. people can just basically pick whatever is their preferred platform and, and it will link you directly to our film. Um, if you go to church and state documentary.com at the very top of, of our first page, there's like a link that says watch our movie or something like that. I can't remember what it says. I haven't looked at it in a while. Um, but if you click on that, it takes you to that same page and you can kind of see where all, where all the platforms are. So basically it's, it's how, how distribution works is it goes on demand. And then after our on demand period ends, then we go to streaming platforms. So we ha we approached Netflix. They turned us down, um, as far as I know, from our distribution uh, channel guy. Um, but we're hoping for Hulu. Um, he's also in talks with Showtime. So we'll see. That is brilliant. So I yeah. want to just capsulize. You went from leaving an education consulting HR sort of path. Yeah to retail so you went from letter carrying to coaching to filmmaking so holly this is what i would love to do uh, <laughs> your story is so rich and deep with detail i want to invite you back for another interview where i'm going to ask you and i'll give you my list of questions i'm going to ask you some questions and we'll go back because i think this is a two-part series here awesome one is where we'll talk about where you explored your possible identities, like mm -hmm. when you were out in, in Mexico filming and how you executed experiments to see what happened with those identities. Yep. Uh, how we got some small wins, how you survived the Rocky period of not knowing you know, what was gonna happen, connecting with role models, making time to reflect. So there's a whole list of questions I'm gonna send awesome. you. Would you be willing to give us the second half and we'll go deeper into some of the Absolutely. money shifts? Would that be okay? Yeah, that'd be great. Be this, great. this has been fantastic. I, I don't know the, the audience, like, um, well, I'll tell you what we do know. We know yeah. that people in their forties are Googling, how do I change career careers at 40? They do about 760 Google searches Wow. Day. And so I know that your story is going to hit home for people. Yeah. So we'll, we'll come back and we'll do a second piece to this. Perfect. 